there, Jordan Carroll here. Today we're going to talk about discourse, or why we say what we say. Discourse is a concept proposed by French philosopher and social theorist Michel Foucault, author of such books as The Order of Things and Discipline and Punish. What is discourse? Discourse is a certain way of speaking. A discourse is a social system determining all possible statements that can be made in a given field in a particular historical moment. A discourse defines what is sayable and unsayable, what counts as a meaningful statement, and what counts as meaningless noise. For example, in an English class, you might interpret a text or make a statement about a text's history. But if you came to class with a measurement of how much the book weighed, or if you described to the class your dreams about the characters in a novel, your statements would fall outside of the discourse of the English discipline. Your statements wouldn't even be wrong, they would just be invalid. Discourse includes what counts as a topic, who can speak, and how do we interpret what they say? How do we know what we know? And what counts as truth? From these questions, you can see Foucault was less interested in the contents of statements and more interested in finding the preconditions that made statements possible in the first place. You might think of discourse like grammar. Most of us speak in grammatically correct sentences most of the time. But few of us know all the rules of grammar, and we rarely, if ever, consciously think about the structure of grammar even while we're using it. Discourse is the grammar of what is knowable and sayable. Here, it is important to remember that discourse doesn't have to be true in some sense that we believe in. Practices like trial by combat or soothsaying represent a discourse on the truth just as much as, say, modern science. A discursive formation is a set of statements governed by shared rules. Discursive formations are characterized more by disagreement and division, or what Foucault would call dispersion, than by coherence and unity. Let's take economics as an example of a discursive formation. Free market economists and Keynesian economists might disagree on a number of fundamental points, but they still agree on the kinds of arguments that can be made. They have shared standards of evidence, shared assumptions about who counts as an expert, and shared areas of concern. An economist may or may not agree with their colleagues on the wisdom of, say, supply-side economics, but she would never present a poem as definitive proof of her economic theories, nor would she try to use economics to figure out like the age of the solar system. Those kinds of statements and those kinds of problems fall outside of economics altogether. Let's look at an example from Foucault's History of Sexuality, one that shows why discourse analysis is so important. In early modern Europe, legal and religious discourse defined same-sex sexual acts as sodomy. Sodomy, however, included a wide range of criminalized, non-procreative sexual behaviors. Sodomy was defined as the use of non-sexual organs for sex or any sex that could not lead to reproduction. Sodomy as a concept therefore included bestiality, and oral sex between people of different genders, as well as same-sex sexual behavior. By the 19th century, however, medical discourse had singled out same-sex sexual practices and set them apart from other kinds of sexual practices. Sodomy became homosexuality, not simply an action or a crime, but an essential identity. Here we see that a shift in discourse resulted in the creation of an entirely new identity category. Instead of being one sexual practice among many, 
same-sex sexual acts became an exclusive choice. Whereas the archetypical sodomite might have sex with men, women, or animals at various moments, the homosexual was depicted as desiring only people of the same gender. Whereas sodomy was an isolated crime, homosexuality was presented as a deep part of someone's subjectivity. To know that someone was homosexual was to know the truth about them. This discourse has been shared by sexual radicals and homophobic reactionaries alike, presenting us with the horizon of things that can be said about sexuality through much of the modern period. We can see from this example that Foucault was interested in what discourse does, or discursive practice. He's interested not simply in how discourse reflects the world or represents the world, but how it changes the world. Discourse constructs the very thing that it describes. To steal an example from Ian Hacking, let's think about what happens when discourse categorizes children with difficulty paying attention. If discourse defines these children as fidgety, then it might call for more punishments in the classroom. Moreover, fidgetiness is no different from other forms of unruly behavior, like, say, gum chewing or swearing. If discourse defines these children as hyperactive, it might segregate them from other students in the classroom and call for STEM-free classrooms, which are drab and free of distraction. Finally, however, if it defines children as attention deficit, or ADHD, it, call, it might call for children to be medicated. An entire medical apparatus will spring up around the child with difficulty paying attention. In other words, discourse isn't just idle chatter. It's bound up in real-world changes in institutions, and these institutions have material impacts on the people involved. Discourse shapes the very thing that it describes. So let's recap a little, little bit. A discourse is not simply speech, language, or representation. And it's definitely not the notion that you can say something and it becomes true or real. Discourse is a set of socially enforced regulations that govern speech, language, and representation, as well as other ways of knowing and categorizing the world. Furthermore, a discourse is not a unified school of thought. Discourse includes a range of possible positions that you might take on a given topic or issue. Republicans and Democrats, for example, often share the same discourse. Finally, discourse is not a form of individual expression. Discourse determines what an individual says and not the other way around, or determines what they can say. If you, say, submit an aesthetic appreciation of a rock to a geology journal, your contribution to that discourse will probably remain unrecognized, unpublished, and largely forgotten. It falls out of the archive entirely. To participate in discourse, then, you must abide by its rules or risk being silenced. <laughs>